It's almost Easter and we think the bunny has hidden some eggs for us to find. It's a widely accepted folk custom, but we have questions. Why eggs? Why are they painted or made of chocolate? Why do we play games with them? And where did the rabbit come from? Let's start at the beginning. Why eggs? Now you've probably heard that eggs are a symbol of the rebirth of Jesus because they are traditionally associated with life and fertility. It's not even limited to Christianity. Luxuriously decorated ostrich eggs have been found in ancient Egyptian tombs. Vedic texts and Zoroastrian mythology refer to the concept of the cosmic or world egg. And in Chinese culture, red eggs are handed out even today at an infant's full month or first birthday. However, there's another very specific reason we primarily associate Easter with eggs. During Lent, the 40 days running up to Easter, eggs, along with meat and dairy, were off the menu. Therefore, when Easter rolled around, you had an abundance of them. The period between Christmas and Easter can be a bit of a barren time for the pre-industrial dinner table. Meat from the pig slaughtered for Christmas would have run out in midwinter, and it would be quite some time before it would be available again. During the dark cold winters, chickens would also stop laying until the days got warmer. Enter Lent, the church's way of turning rationing out of necessity into a virtuous act of faith. In many countries, the days before Lent are seen as a last hurrah before you batten down the hatches. This is not without debate, but Carnival, also known as Mardi Gras in Louisiana, is said to come from Carnevale, which in Latin means goodbye meat. Here in Britain, Shrove Tuesday is also Pancake Day, which is delicious and a great way of using up excess eggs. As spring approached, the days got longer and chickens would start laying again. So by the time Easter arrived, you would have a surplus of eggs which needed to be eaten. We do need to note that eggs are not the only food associated with Easter. Sweetbreads and meat were also eaten to celebrate Easter, but these were less accessible to the common folk. In contrast, eggs, widely available at this time of year, would take center stage and attract various superstitions. A common one is that eggs laid on Good Friday would never go bad. We have our doubts, but please do test this and let us know how it turned out in the comments. A more outlandish belief is that an egg laid on Good Friday would turn into a diamond if kept for a hundred years. If you do set this experiment up, feel free to check back in with us in about a century. Okay, so we now know why we associate eggs with Easter. But why are they painted? To answer this question, we need to go all the way back to the dawn of humanity. This might be oversimplifying things a little, but it does seem a human trait to see the homogenous surface of an egg and feel the desire to decorate it. The oldest decorated egg ever discovered dates back 60,000 years. And we still don't know whether they did this to convey meaning, ownership, or simply because it was pretty. During the Iron Age, humans went to great lengths to steal eggs from wild ostriches, paint them, add precious minerals or ivory, then trade them as luxury items. Edward I was known to have ordered 450 eggs to be painted and covered in gold leaf to be handed out to his court at Easter. And the Russians took the practice to an entirely new level. In the 3rd or 4th century, Early Christians, in what is now Iraq and Armenia, started linking the craft of egg decorating with Easter. From there, the tradition spread westwards to Greece, then all over Europe with various regional variations. One feature that probably didn't hurt the popularity of decorating eggs was the low cost involved. One of the oldest surviving traditions comes from Greece, which uses onion skins, something already destined for the bin. The long and short of it is that the eggs boiled in the onion skins would take on a reddish color. The egg surplus from Lent would need to be preserved until Easter. And what better way to extend the shelf life of an egg than to boil it? Dying with onion skins not only scratches our itch to decorate the eggs, thanks to the resulting red color, it also ties in with the story of Easter. In Greek Orthodoxy, the red symbolizes the blood of Christ. The egg is rebirth. While in Western Europe this tradition mainly stayed limited to simple dyed eggs, Eastern Europe has developed 
and maintained an intricate tradition of complex patterns with different symbolism, elevating the humble egg from a snack to a piece of art to be kept for years. To recreate these red eggs, bring 2 litres of water to a boil with a handful of onion skin. These can be red or yellow onions. Add a generous glug of vinegar, then take some eggs. Give them a quick wipe with vinegar and drop them into the pot to simmer for 30 minutes. After half an hour, take them off the heat and allow the entire mixture to cool down for at least another 30 minutes before removing the eggs from the water. At this point, be careful not to wipe the eggs when they are still wet, as the dye needs to set. Once dry, rub them with some oil for a nice sheen. If you are using yellow onions, you can wrap the eggs into the skins and use a bit less vinegar. That way you can get these mottled looking eggs whichever takes your preference. We tested two other natural dyes, turmeric, which makes the eggs yellow, duh, and red cabbage, which gives the eggs a nice blue hue. Do note that we discovered that it is best to make the dyes separately, then submerge an already hard boiled egg into them overnight, instead of boiling for 30 minutes, as these dyes take longer to stain eggshells. You can also do this with the onion based dye if you prefer. Overnight dyeing has one added benefit, by applying some wax onto the eggshell with a crayon or, if you are skilled enough, a kistka, you can create shapes ranging from the basic to the intricate. Best part, because all these dyes are food based, you can eat all the eggs afterwards. Of course, if you did spend a lot of effort, you might not want to crack these eggs on Easter morning, so it makes more sense to empty the eggs before decorating them. Now that the edible part is safely removed, we can freely paint them without worrying about food safety, using paints like acrylic, which you should not use on an egg if you plan to eat it. And there you have it, a colourful selection ranging from a dyed breakfast item to a gift for a king. Oh, here's a little side note. In pre-industrial society, eggs were so crucial, they sometimes served as a parallel currency. Speaking of currency, chances are that if you're watching this, you've seen at least one advert. We don't get any of that revenue yet. But you can help us change that by pressing the subscribe button. It's completely free for you, but it would help us on the way of making our eggs from this. Thank you. Now, back to the story. Before we move on to hiding the eggs, there's one more question to address. Why are all the commercial eggs these days made from chocolate? The first chocolate egg was apparently made around 1700, at the court of Louis XIV. However, this was more of a novelty than a snack, as this was still the unsweetened bitter chocolate and an egg coated in this chocolate, rather than an egg made of chocolate. 25 years later in Turin, a lady recorded only as the widow Gambione tried to invert this process by filling up hollowed eggshells with chocolate, creating solid chocolate eggs. She must have had really strong teeth. Later in the 19th century, a trend appeared of making big artificial eggs, usually wooden or cardboard and velvet, which contained presents. Even the royalty joined in. In 1863, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, <coughs> Baby very happy with huge Easter egg containing a doll in its toilet, which Alfie had brought her. Almost a decade later, J.S. Fry claims to have created the first hollow chocolate egg, allowing for presents to be put in it. The company was later bought out by Cadbury, and that's how we get from this to this. So if you are wondering why they are usually wrapped in colourful tin foil, that's a reference to the old dyed eggs. Don't worry, we're not making chocolate eggs in this video. Pouring them in a mould is easy enough, but we're not going to get into tempering this year. Ok, so now we know why we have colourful and chocolate eggs, but why do we play all these weird games with them? We like this sentiment in this reference to the most famous of Easter games, the Easter Egg Hunt. In 1643, Georg Frank von Frankenau, a German doctor, wrote in Alsace and neighboring regions, these eggs are called hair eggs, because of the myth told to fool simple people and children that the Easter hare is going around laying eggs and hiding them in the herb garden. So the children look for them even more enthusiastically, to the delight of smiling adults. That last line really captures why we think all the Easter games are so widespread. It's fun. 
Easter marks the start of spring and it is often the first holiday of the year with weather nice enough for outdoor activities. Easter has always been a very happy holiday. It is the most holy day on the Christian calendar. Christmas has nothing on Easter. Everyone is born, but coming back from the dead? Now there's a showstopper act. This was the original most wonderful time of the year. People got new clothes, the king bestowed new noble titles and crests, everyone was allowed to eat nice food again and we're all happy to have survived another winter. And this is why we think people have thought up weird and fun things to do with eggs. Depending on where you're from, you either knock eggs, roll them in a race, hand them out at place or, the most common of the lot, hide them. One of the oldest games is egg tapping. It boils down to picking the right egg, tapping them together and the one that breaks loses. In most varieties that we've seen, the players have two lives and you only lose when both sides of your egg are cracked. Egg rolling is essentially what it says on the tin. In Northwest England, they claim that the tradition started there centuries ago and to this day eggs are rolled off Holcomb Hill. We don't know if it really started there though as we did find some articles saying that it originated in France and that the winner got a hogshead of wine. That's France for you. Wherever it came from, the most famous egg roll these days happens on the lawn of the White House where every year the President of the United States oversees children racing their eggs along a flat stretch of grass. Unlike the North English egg rolls, these have to be helped along with a spoon because helicopters have trouble landing on slopes. In Britain, pace egg plays are performed by troops of mummers, depicting some form of mock combat, resulting in one of the combatants dying, then coming back from the dead. Performers then receive pace eggs, usually mottled red from onion skins like their Greek counterparts. We could go on and on about all the different games that people have come up with, but all the Easter games are just that. Games. With eggs. The egg knocking is conquers with eggs. The egg hunt is hide and seek with eggs. And we all know how much the English love chasing things that roll off a hill. Be it a wheel of cheese or eggs. There is one element of that essay of von Frankenau which sticks in the mind for us. The hair. From the 17th century, we start seeing references coming from the Protestant communities on the European continent to the Easter hare who lays eggs. Some say Martin Luther himself organized egg hunts. We have no proper source for this though. Many of these German Protestants then moved to the New World and through some typical localization and genetics, the German Easter Hare became the Anglo-Saxon Easter Bunny. To this day, in large parts of Europe, it's still a hare who lays and brings the eggs. Whether this was laid or <coughs> laid is never properly explained, maybe for the best. It does need to be pointed out that the bunny or hare is very much a Protestant thing. The distinction is pretty much gone these days, but for a long time it wasn't a bunny who brought the eggs in Catholic countries. Catholic church bells don't ring on the Saturday before Easter as this symbolizes that Christ is dead. Catholic children in France and Belgium were told that the bells had flown off to Rome, returning on Easter Sunday to deliver eggs from up high. So next time somebody complains that the story of the Easter Bunny is too unrealistic, tell them about egg dispensing bell drones. All very cool, but uh, where did the bunny come from? There aren't any in the Bible. The most common explanation is that the Germanic goddess Istra or Estra, from whom we get the word Easter, had a hair as a symbol. However, this is highly debated and referring to pagan deities doesn't sound very Lutheran. In all fairness, nobody really knows where the exact origin of the Easter hair lies. But here is an interesting theory. Ever since ancient times and across many cultures, the moon has been associated with hares and rabbits, just like eggs have pretty ubiquitously been symbols of fertility and rebirth. In the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, the date for Easter was set at the Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. In other words, 
Easter is a lunar holiday, and when you are lying on the moon, a hare or bunny is never far away. So, however you celebrate Easter, Paschal or Passover this spring, note that the eggs, the bunny and even the timing of the day goes back centuries and maybe all the way back to the moon. We hope you enjoyed this video on the story behind Easter eggs. Please leave us a like or a comment if you did. Thank you very much for watching.